Good morning. Happy President's Day. So it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, guest speaker today, uh, Manny Gabriel. Uh, I think many of you know Manny. <clears throat> Manny was uh, a resident in our program. We did a, a great job. Uh, Manny's originally from New Jersey. Uh, he pretty much did, uh, before coming here, did most of his education in, in New Jersey, grew up there, uh, graduated from uh, Drew University uh, in uh, Madison, and then went to uh, uh, UMDNJ uh, for medical school, where he uh, uh, basically entered into their MD-PhD program. Uh, Manny came here, as I said, did uh, a terrific job as a as a resident, and then was uh, uh, accepted and is uh, completing his surgical oncology uh, fellowship at Roswell Park in Buffalo. Uh, and Manny's going to talk to us today about uh, new approaches to imaging and therapy. Dr. Gabriel. I think I remember these buttons. We'll see. It's a test. I'm just going to press all of them. Does that work? <laughs> All right, well, it's, it's great to be back. My in-laws lost power last night, so it was a little, little, not the best welcome, but <laughs> that's right, that's right. But it's great to be back. Thanks for that kind introduction. And what I'm going to talk to you is a little bit about the research that I've been doing at Roswell Park, talking really about tumor vasculature. One is, part of it is looking at imaging, and then one is trying to take advantage of our new imaging techniques to hopefully translate into better therapy. I have no disclosures, and as many of you know, angiogenesis has mostly revolved around VEGF. So there are VEGF inhibitors in cancer. These are the first approved drugs that actually target angiogenesis. There are others. This is on the bottom figure here, S1P. One of our researchers, Kazuke Dekabe, works on this. And so I just put this up as an introduction. There are multiple ways to target vessels, uh, and this is sort of like what's the mainstream now. When looking at vessels, typically under immunohistochemistry, there are differences between a normal healthy vessel and tumor vessels, right? So on this side, a healthy vessel typically has this appearance. They have these normal expected branch points that come as the vessels get larger to smaller sizes versus this haphazard array of just tumor vessels. They can have different shapes. They can loop on themselves. Sometimes you can see just a circular vessel that doesn't really have a beginning and end. It really serves no function. So disorganization, distribution is different. The permeability, so tumor vessels tend to be leakier. They will have more edema consistent with them, differences in interstitial pressure, and, and so forth. So there's a lot of differences within these, and we hope to take advantage of these differences. When we talk about interstitial hypertension, if you can imagine a tumor, it's basically a ball of cells that has grown, and so the pressure within it is very high compared to the surrounding tissue. And this has implications, because if you can imagine, just based on physics, the blood flow coming into the tumor is going to be impeded, right, because the pressure within it is going to be higher. Similarly, the pressure coming out, or the, the efferent, is going to be pushed and sort of helped by the tumor, because anything that's going into the tumor is going to get a hard time going in, Anything that gets into it, the tumors basically has a high pressure, so it's going to push things out. Uh, and that has a lot of implications, because if you can imagine trying to get a drug to the tumor, well, you have to fight that interstitial pressure to get the chemotherapy in, and then once it's in, the pressure within the tumor itself might actually facilitate the removal of that drug. This is another researcher at Roswell Park, Elizabeth Rapasky, who's actually looking at the same type of thing, trying to manipulate tumor pressure in order to augment the immune response. So all of these characteristics of tumor vessels, therefore, have these important implications. Their arrangement, their, the increased interstitial hypertension, they all affect flow. And if the flow is non-functional, meaning if you can't get flow to your target, then your treatment's not going to be very efficacious. And so what we're going to try to do is try to overcome these limitations. And so this was our initial approach. We call it dynamic control. So all of you, you know, residents, everyone here knows that different types of vasoactive agents will affect your blood pressure, will affect your blood flow. You use it in the ICU. 
you use it for people who have hypertension. So one of the dilators we chose was nicardipine. It's a calcium channel blocker, as you know, that'll potentially increase the diameter of tumors of any blood vessel in order to increase flow. And one we chose was a vasoconstrictor. We used phenylephrine, which is a selective, as you know, alpha-1 agonist. This is the platform that we use. It's called intravital microscopy. And what you're seeing here is it's a, basically just a fluorescent microscope. You can use it in mouse. And here's a mouse that's been anesthetized. Uh, you can either use an injection of ketamine or you can use a nose cone with isoflurane. And you just need to keep them still. And then there's this piece that's implanted surgically into the mouse. This is called a window chamber. So, you know, mouse dip backs have very lax skin. You could sort of <clears throat> stretch their dorsal fold out pretty much, pretty extensively. And basically what you do is you cut one surface of that skin. So you have, you know, a piece of skin hanging up, and there's two sides of it. You cut one side out, and then you implant this hardware. There's a sort of socket here with a glass chamber, and on the magnified view, you can see these blood vessels within the within the mouse skin. So you have a window directly into the tumor, or in this case, the normal vessels, but you have a window directly into the vessels. You can inject tumor into this little chamber. If you inject tumor into here, the tumor will grow, and then as the tumor grows, you can observe what's happening in real time, keeping the mouse alive. You can bring them back to the, the microscope stand multiple, multiple times to see how the tumor is changing the vasculature over time. This is not new technology. This has been around for probably 20 or 30 years, but we'll show you how we, we modified it. We use fluorescent dyes to increase the observation. So these are things that all of you have used in plastic surgery, like to check the flap, fluorescein, ICG. You give it to the patient, and it basically, you know, you're trying to see the viability of the tissue, or if you're looking at bowel, similar concept. With the microscope, you can actually see individual blood vessels at the capillary level. You can see red blood cells going through individual capillaries. So the resolution is much better with intravital microscopy. What's nice here is that the two dyes that are typically normally used, commercially available, there are others, but these are sort of the standard ones, they approximate chemotherapy molecular weights pretty well. So we can sort of extrapolate that if ICG is able to reach the tumor, then potentially, you know, arenotecan or doxorubicin will too. So it's sort of an extrapolation. <laughs> Fluorescein is a lighter molecular weight, so it tends to bleed out faster from the vessels. It goes into the vessels, and then it's, you know, these capillaries tend to be leakier to smaller molecules, so they'll leak out, versus ICG, which will be retained within the vessels a little, a little bit longer. So as I said, you know, IVM's been around for a while. It's used to study multiple things. Uh, all of these I've talked about. Other things, not only just drug delivery, but lymphocyte trafficking, very hot topic, melanoma, kidney disease, kidney cancer, and you know, PD-1 inhibitors, things like that, are being trying to be applied to multiple cancers across the spectrum. So this is something where you can actually tag lymphocytes fluorescently and watch them traffic to the tumor. And then also you can test things like we talked initially about, VEGF inhibitors, S1P inhibitors, to see if that breaks down the tumor vessel structure. So this is some of our, orig our, our first data about a while ago now. This is September 2nd of, I think, 2014. And this just shows a mouse chamber that had tumors implanted into it. And so you can see some of the, these are tumor vessels, and it's hard to say whether they're venules or arterioles. They sort of lose that definition when they grow up in a tumor. But you can see that this is a disorganized architecture. You don't, you know, in normal cells, you don't see tumors take this hairpin sort of loop here. Here's a tumor vessel that's just kind of going around in a circle. And then these yellow arrows show vessels that haven't taken up the dye. So if you took a normal mouse and injected them with fluorescein, all of the vessels will light up bright. But here are some vessels that we would call non-functional. They're basically either clotted or dead vessels, and they're not carrying any flow. And you know they're not carrying flow because they don't have any dye. This is work uh, done by Dan Fisher in a lab earlier where he looked at lymphocyte trafficking. So each of these white dots is basically a lymphocyte. It has been fluorescently labeled with fluorescein and then injected into mice. And if you take, this is a normal tumor. This is what we call a systemic thermal treatment. So he was studying the effect of heat on lymphocyte trafficking. And so this is normal skin where the lymphocytes aren't going to traffic because they're honed to a specific antigen for a tumor. When you try to traffic those lymphocytes in tumor-bearing mice, the normal temperature to mice, you can see maybe like three or five lymphocytes actually traffic. When you increase a thermal response, when you just do something as simple as 
incubate the mouse, it releases basically cytokines like IL-6, IL-12, and that facilitates an increased response. I think you could see the difference here in terms of the amount of lymphocyte trafficking. So this is one of the, just an example of one of the ways we use IVM to study tumors. Going back to vessels, we really wanted to target dynamic control. So our hypothesis was the tumor vessels, as opposed to normal vessels, can be controlled with vasoactive agents and that we could directly observe it using intravital microscopy. So the design of this was kind of simple. We took the window chambers into white mice, BALB-C mice. We implanted in the first set of mice, we used a colon cancer model. Uh, we'll just call the tumor line CT26. And then we used the dyes to enhance the observation. And then we had chosen a vasodilator and a vasoconstrictor. We wanted to see how either one would work in terms of the vasoactive, the, the dynamic control. Mm -hmm. These dosages come from the literature. They're well established in different sort of mechanisms and different models. And both of these, what's nice is that they have a rapid onset and, and sort of a rapid offset. So you'll see effects just like in humans. Like if you put someone on a phenylephrine drip, you're going to see an effect pretty fast. You take it off and they're not ready, they're going to tank out. So it's the same thing with mice. This is looking at nicardipine first in a non-tumor model. So it's sort of our baseline. And what you can do is you can magnify the image. This is, you can see the timestamp here. Uh, like one hour into the, well, it starts sort of at one hour of the experiment. And then, or sorry, this is the minutes. This is one minute, 21 seconds. This is milliseconds. And then we give a dose of narcotropine and then measure the tumor diameters later, like five, seven minutes later. And what you do is you just sort of take measurements. So you can magnify this. You can pick points across the whole length of the vessel. That's where the standard deviation comes. You're just basically measuring the diameter. When you give narcotropine, as you would expect, the, the diameter of the, the normal vessel increases. So it's going basically 10 micrometers higher. And you can measure this, and you, know, you can see the standard deviation. If you do it in a tumor, they actually don't respond. So this picture looks different because it's brighter. This one happens to have the fluorescein in it. A couple of observations you can see is, first of all, the tumors are very haphazard. This looks like, like roots of a tree going into this main tumor vessel. You won't see this in a normal mouse. But you give them a cutterpene, and here it's at 34 minutes, here it's at 40 minutes, so same similar time difference. There's no difference. So the nicardipine didn't really have the same effect on the tumor vessel as it did on a normal vessel. So we abandoned the nicardipine. We went with the phenylephrine. I won't show you the phenylephrine slides, but basically, because phenylephrine is vasoconstricting, it didn't really show a difference, at least a measurable difference. But we hypothesized that even though we couldn't measure the change in diameter, that phenylephrine may work in other ways, particularly if you combine it with volume expansion. So going back to you know, your patient in the ICU, they're tanking out, you give them phenylephrine, but typically they have to have enough volume, right? So you have to give them saline or, or some sort of colloid in order to expand the fluid volume so that the phenylephrine can work. So we apply the same thing in the mouse. And we hypothesize in this, in this setting that we can increase the blood flow through tumors by doing all of these things. And hopefully that would either expand the total volume, it could shunt the systemic volume to the tumor bed, and then overcome that interstitial pressure that I talked about within the tumor. So in this experiment, tumor mice were given one of three treatment options, either just a saline bolus. 500 microliters is equivalent to about like a sixth of a, of a mouse total volume, so similar to humans. Uh, phenylephrine alone, again, the same dose, and then a saline bolus followed, so the combination, so saline plus phenylephrine. And this is what we found. So, of course, we always want to show the best data. This was the best mouse out of a group of about 10. But on this slide here, you can see this tumor here, or this tumor vessel, has flow going through it. It's, it's bright, whereas this one is dark. After we do the treatment, you can see this, you know, it, it restores flow. It has dye in it. And we can actually record the video. And so here's the baseline. So this is the picture you just saw, very sluggish flow going through this vessel here. This vessel has no flow. We don't know if it's dead or not, but it's, it clearly doesn't have flow. We introduced the bolus, and now you can see it's pushing. It's sort of like the, the bolus is pushing the stuff within, and I will mention that this is 2x speed, but it's all going to be 2x speed, just because, you know, time constraints. We add the phenylephrine the first dose, 
And I don't know if you caught it, but there was a slight reversal of flow in this, this vessel. And then after we wait about six minutes, I think you'd agree that the, vessel, the, the velocity within the vessel that was once non-functional has picked up tremendously, whereas the other vessel has slowed down a little bit. And this is what we expect, right? Because phenylephrine is clamping down in your systemic vasculature. So the normal vessel that was already functional now has to fight against a higher pressure gradient as it returns back basically to your heart. Whereas the other one, which was non-functional, we had supplied some of the pressure to it with the phenylephrine and the bolus, and now that got restored. Whoops. So you may ask, well, what if you just use the phenylephrine by itself or the bolus by itself? I will tell you, I won't show you the, the bolus by itself, but the phenylephrine by itself has sort of a similar, though somewhat decreased response. So here's the baseline. You can see all of these vessels. There's no flow within them. And then when we do push the phenylephrine, you can almost see, you can see like the dye now coming through, flow getting restored. Now the dye is coming through. So in vessels that were once non-functional, we're able to restore them. And then post-treatment, similar things, you know, uh, we can't restore all of them, so here's a vessel that still maintains its non-functionality. Here's another one, but many of the vessels are able to, and this one almost looks like, I don't know if you can appreciate it, it's slowly trying to push it through and restore it, slowly trying to restore the flow. And this is what we want because we hypothesize that if we're able to increase the blood flow to the tumor, then we could increase effects of our anti-cancer drugs. So that was all in a colon cancer model. We looked at other tumor types. So B16 is a melanoma. We did the same thing, implanted the B16 melanoma cells into a window chamber. And here, you can kind of see melanoma is a little bit different, difficult to study because it's pigmented. So these are the actual melanoma cells. But you can see this vessel here is sort of like the most haphazard one. When we give a bolus, not too much of an effect. So the blood flow you know, in melanoma wasn't doing too much. Certainly not as compared to the, uh, the colon model. When we give the phenylephrine, you can see a little bit of increase, but certainly not as dramatic as the colon model. And then for this one, we actually grew someone impatient, so we dose it with another phenylephrine dose, and it sort of um, had, had slight responses, but not as certainly dramatic as before. So then we also tested a breast line. So 4T1 is a breast tumor cell. And so here you can see very haphazard baseline. So look at all of these tumor vessels. You won't see this in normal. It's sort of this haphazard conglomeration of all of these vessels. This is the baseline. And then what's interesting here is you give the bolus, there's no real difference. The velocity is basically the same. And this one doesn't have too many non-functional vessels to start with, so you won't see any res restoration. When you give the phenylephrine, so keep an eye on the direction of the blood flow going sort of in this direction. And then after a time stamp, it stops, reverses flow. So this going back to, again, overcoming the systemic pressure. You've basically increased the systemic pressure, and now those vessels are having a hard time fighting that systemic pressure. So the blood stops, reverses flow, so it sort of stays within the tumor a longer time. And that's also something we would want. We would want, if you have drug within the blood system, you would want it to sort of hang out and percolate within the tumor system. You want to maximize that time. And this is one other example of the breast line where you can see here uh, we give first the dye. The dye is coming in. You can see that nicely. And then when we add the bolus, no real difference at this point. And then when we add the phenylephrine, I don't know if you can appreciate it, but it'll basically stop reverse flow. And so we're seeing the same sort of effects. So three different tumor lines, three somewhat different responses. So in one of them, you saw non-functional vessels get restored. In one of them, you clearly saw the, the reversal of blood flow. And so this can be due to different effects. We postulate that inflow and outflow vessels that may have some sort of effect on what observations we're seeing, and then functional versus non-functional. So in vessels that are already having flow within the tumor system, if we do this sort of treatment, we actually reverse flow. And then in vessels that are non-functional, we potentially can actually restore flow. 
and there may be different, there, we're using different tumor types, and so this can have somewhat, some explanation that still needs to be worked out on why we're seeing differences within different tumor types. So I'd like to move away from the mouse for a second and talk about how this applies to humans, because if it doesn't apply to humans, then you know, people lose interest. So this is a study by our lab that was published uh, last year, Nature Communications. It was the first study of using human intravital microscopy. So, so basically, I'll, I'll show you what it looks like, but this was the first in-human study using IVM. At this point, it's always been in animals. Uh, that study picked melanoma, because as you can imagine, melanoma is superficial. It's something that's easy to study with a microscope. You can just sort of plop the microscope down onto the patient. Uh, we used fluorescein just like we use in the mouse. The anesthesiologist would dose it. And then we looked at different melanoma types, so in transit disease, bulky primary, buccal nodal metastases. And the outcomes were looking at if we could measure diameter and flow, and if we could detect fluorescein. So this is the microscope that we use. This is patented by Joseph Skitsky and basically owned by Roswell Park. It is the same sort of microscope that is used in the lab, but it's basically mounted on this computer apparatus with this base. This granite base weighs around 800 pounds so that you know, this cantilevered microscope doesn't tip over. And it's portable, so you can wheel it into the operating room. And so the idea is you choose the patients who meet the trial. And basically, it's anyone who has a visible melanoma who needs surgery. You can't have an allergy to fluorescein, so we do a skin prick test before. And if you have an allergy, obviously, you can't get dosed with a fluorescein. And then other different exclusion criteria here, basically, basically people who can't have surgery. And here's how, we did, how it was done. Um, prior to excising the melanoma to margins, either one or two centimeter margins, a flap is made. So theoretically, it does disturb some of the blood vessels because you are altering the natural you know, setting of the tumor. And then once the flap is made and you expose the vessels, you just mount and dock the microscope over the area that you want to observe. So here was the patient, and basically, you, know, you can use some sutures to help put the orient the specimen in place, or not the specimen, but the tissue in place, and then you walk over with a microscope. As I said, <clears throat> if you disturb the tumors, the tumor vessels, you may actually uh, <clears throat> uh, affect the structure and the architecture and flow before you actually know what's happening because you've cut on the tumor. This was an example of a very extrophic melanoma. This happened, this turned out to be a nodular melanoma. And so on this patient, we didn't have to do any surgery prior. It was already open. Uh, it was, sorry, not open. It was already easily to observe. And so you can see the, va the vasculature here is, you know, ready to be observed by the microscope. And this was an example of a patient who we were able to use the microscope with prior to any surgery. And a lot of the results were similar. These are other of the patients, one through 10. You can see, again, many of the patients had these non-functional vessels. So you can see bright vessels in the context of like non-bright or dark vessels. You can measure velocity and flow. You can actually see individual capillaries and red blood cells and measure them from this point to this point and calculate flows. And then you can measure diameters like I did in the mouse, um, all different types of, of sort of physical and, um, and structural measurements that you can make. And <clears throat> this was basically a summary of all of the 10 patients. <clears throat> you, we were able to detect Diameters or measure diameters in 90%, measure density in 90%, and 70% of the patients took up fluorescein. So this was our pilot study and the results of the pilot study. For patients who were not successes, so those 10% or 30% where you could not measure different structural aspects, we found out this mostly because they had a desmoplastic reaction. So the, the, the specimens after they were removed, of course, are sent to pathology to confirm margins and the final staging of the melanoma. Here, those patients basically had an inflammatory reaction, which shut down blood flow to different areas of the tumor, and that's why we couldn't measure them. So these are patients, when we start talking about things like personalized medicine or individualized medicine, it's very sort of big in cancer right now. It's usually based in genomics, where they're trying to figure out your specific genetic mutation or your specific you know, protein that you're lacking. This is something where potentially you're a patient who won't respond to this type of treatment because you're not gonna, you know, if we give you the, the phenylephrine and the, the saline bolus, we can't overcome the high pressure within your tumor because of this desmoplastic reaction. So it's not for everybody, but it can potentially tailor, tailor treatments to individuals. And then this is sort of going along with the lines I was saying that the, tumor, the tumors are sent to, I, to pathology for immunohistochemistry, 
<clears throat> if you look at this, these columns versus these columns, the point to make out here is the diameter. So the diameter in real time, when we're measuring it, much larger, about two to three times larger than the diameters after the tumor's been fixed and preserved. Of course, one of the reasons is tumor shrinkage. So anytime you know you send, you remove a melanoma or breast cancer, you have you think you have one centimeter margins, and then you know when it comes back, your margins are like 0 0.8 centimeters or something like that. So the formalin and stuff shrinks the tumor. The other thing is that in vivo, the tumors have flow going through them, so you would expect them to be a little bit larger. This is important because when you think about what goes into flow calculations, the diameter plays a very large role. So here, basically what I'm saying is the diameters in vivo are larger than predicted in vitro or histo histologically. And so if you remember back from your physics, Pousset's law, the flow is proportional to these things. And the thing that has the largest impact is the radius because it's to the fourth power. So when you do things like pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, they're typically based not only in a living system, but based on flow diameters, which are taken outside the body. And so this can have important implications on treatment, you know, dosing and things like that. <clears throat> and that's with regard to chemotherapy. When we talk about things like immunotherapy, when we talk about the PD-1 inhibitors, CTLA-4 inhibitors, then vessel shear becomes important because the way that immunotherapy works is bringing lymphocytes, effector lymphocytes, to your tumor. So here, the larger the diameter, the lower the shear. And you can just basically think of shear as how lymphocytes roll along the vessel. So if you have too much flow, or if your shear is too high or low, that will uh, sort of diminish the optimization of those tumor vessels sticking and rolling and then going into the, the interstitium through diapedesis and things like that. So this can also have implications on not only chemotherapy, but immunotherapy. So from this trial, they concluded you know, a high proportion of tumor vessels, up to 50%, do not support flow. It was similar to some of the mouse models. I talked about the vessel diameters and the wall shear also. So the next step was to, all right, so we proved that first in human, we can do this. We can use the microscope to observe melanoma cells. Uh, when I got to Roswell Park, then I was uh, brought into this project, and I wrote the clinical trial to look now at the sentinel node. So similar to breast, you know, if you have melanoma, meet certain criteria, we do sentinel node biopsies to help sort of stage patients and do some prognostication. Uh, I do have to thank the AACR ASCO workshop in Vail, Colorado. I think I'm over there. But I was able to go there and learn how to write clinical trials. And, uh, and it was, what's that? <laughs> well, yeah, that's right, that's right. I have sunglasses on, but I'm pretty sure that's me. Uh, but you know, it was a really good tool to help learn how to write clinical trials. So this is the approach that we use, very similar to the pilot trial. Uh, imagine this is your groin, like you had a melanoma on your leg. It maps to your groin. You similarly raise flaps, and then you sort of plop down the microscope over your flap. Um, this is basically the inclusion and exclusion criteria, very similar, except you need to meet a stage, so this is everyone, stage 1B to 3C, anyone who would have a uh, sentinel node required. Um, we enrolled the first patient back in November. This was a 65-year-old woman. She had a 1B melanoma. Uh, it would arose from a congenital nevus, and then this was her pathology, so she was actually node negative. This was, if this towel is covering the foot, so this is the knee, like on this side of the screen, this was her congenital nevus with the melanoma in the center. That was removed with a light of local excision. And then this is the actual lymph node. So all of you have seen this, right? You, in breast or melanoma, you expose lymph node. Grossly, it doesn't look like much. Here's the node, but you don't, you can't really see the vessels. I mean, you don't know what's happening in terms of the microvasculature. Are they going to look like tumor vessels? Are they going to look like normal vessels? So this is that patient in real time. Here's Joseph Skitsky. Uh, he's the PI that I've been working under. Here's me sort of docking the microscope over. There's a light here in the microscope that's sitting now over the patient's groin. And then here's the computer, which is capturing the images. So this is how we do it in real time. In all, it adds about 10 to 15 minutes to the procedure. So it's not that costly. I guess you can argue that you know 15 minutes of anesthesia amounts to $50,000 or something like that. But it it's, doesn't add too much to the procedure. So the issue with doing it in human is the image stabilization. So in a mouse, you know, the mouse is just kind of laying there. They're totally anesthetized. In the human, any sort of small variations are going to cause a lot of artifact. And that's what you're going to see here. So you can see it's very shaky. Um, this, these are fat cells. These are tumor vessels before we put the fluorescein in. 
Um, but in general, the branch patterns are kind of normal. I think, you know, you don't see sort of that weird haphazardness you saw. They're sort of branching at normal interview intervals, and that's kind of what we expected because her pathology was negative. We recently did the second patient. Um, oops, this went the wrong way. Oh, this is, uh, I must have the wrong, this is uh, not the right slide. Basically, it was a patient who had, uh, it was a 1B melanoma, but hers actually came back positive with a focus of three millimeters, and this is her video. So here, let's see if I can freeze it. So if you freeze it here, uh, or maybe somewhere closer. So the trick is here, you know, you have to freeze it at the right spot because, but here, you know, the branch points get a little bit less defined. So here's, you know, you have like these three or four vessels, similar to like that trunk of a tree I saw in that mouse. Um, when we looked around this patient, they didn't look as nicely defined or smooth as the first patient. And that was interesting because she actually ended up having positive, a positive lymph node, so she became stage 3A. And so the implications of this is, can this technology be used as some sort of a biomarker? We talk about things like prognostic biomarkers, basically, you know, can we predict whether a patient's going to have nodal disease prior to actually the pathology? Um, can our technology supersede pathological diagnosis? Because, you know, pathology is not 100%, there's about a 5 to 10% false negative rate. Um, so things like that are what we're looking at. And then response to treatments. If you have this, this haphazard abnormal tumor vessel, either at your primary tumor or at your lymph node, is that going to, what, what I've been talking about, actually influence your response to treatment? So this is technology that can be applied to a lot of different tumor cells, particularly surface malignancies. So peritoneal surface malignancies, this is something from, again, Kaz Takabe at Roswell Park. Um, basically looking at how surface malignancies within the peritoneum, whether they come from colon or appendix or stomach, how they sort of generate and cause carcinomatosis, those are cancers that historically do not respond well to systemic chemotherapy. Um, even though there's newer sort of agents with oxaliplatin and ranitica and things like that, they tend not to have a very good response when they're the, the, the treatment is given systemically. That's why we do things like HIPEC, where intraperitoneal chemotherapy at a higher dose is heated, it's sort of washed around the abdomen and things like that. But if you don't have a good blood supply or if you don't have a good transport or delivery of systemic chemotherapy to these tumor cells, maybe that's the reason why this thing isn't working. So this is something that we're going to proceed next, and as well as inflammatory breast cancer. So if you think of breast cancer, you don't think of as sort of a surface malignancy, right, in terms of luminal A or luminal B type breast cancer, but inflammatory breast cancer is something that has infiltrated the lymphatics. So this is something we can observe directly with this technology. Um, we're a long way away from it, but basically the idea is, you know, if you have a patient, inflammatory breast cancer tends to be something really hard to treat. People, poor prognosis, they get neoadjuvant chemotherapy up front, sometimes radiation, followed by basically a radical mastectomy. Um, but the response rates aren't very high. So if you're able to get a patient, give them this type of treatment with the phenylephrine and the fluid bolus, you can actually just mount the microscope onto the breast and see if you're getting a response. There are, you know, we have to be monitored because uh, you don't want to give phenylephrine in, in a patient who's hypertensive and things like that. So you have to place an A-line and make sure you're giving the right dosages. But this is something that, again, speaks to individualized medicine and may one day um, help us individualize and tailor medications to different patients. So I'd like to go now leave the human field and go back to the mouse real quick. And then this last part of the talk, um, we try to do just that. We try to, so we've been able to show we can observe some of the changes in the vasculature, we can manipulate it, we can increase, restore flow, things like that, but that's like all basic science. Does it really have a translational component? If you add a cancer drug, will it actually increase responses? So we, of course, started in the mouse, and here we use the combination of phenylephrine with chemotherapy and hypothesized that that combination was going to be superior to the chemotherapy alone. A perfect model for this was isolated limb infusion. Because if you can imagine, if you give the drug systemically, it's going to have systemic effects. It's going to potentially cause harm in humans. But in isolated regional perfusions, what you're doing is similar to like a high pec, you're just targeting high dose, high concentration of drug to a limb. So you have to have a tourniquet, like if it's on the groin, a tourniquet on the, on the upper arm. 
and the vessels, the main artery and vein are catheterized typically by interventional radiology, and now you have a closed circuit. So everything going into the limb is going out of the body directly into basically a perfusion machine, which is regulated in terms of temperature, and then you could dose different drugs and things like that. So in that system, that's the first sort of design where we try to, to test this hypothesis of if we can control the tumor ves vessels and vasculature, will that have an effect on the actual drug? The standard drug used in melanoma, there's a melanoma model, is melphalan. That's what we use in humans as well. Sometimes we add actinomycin D, but melphalan is what we use at Roswell Park. Uh, and then we combine, basically, you know, you have the methylene group, you have a control group or phenylephrine alone group, and then the combination. So this is what, how we do it in mice, basically. Uh, in humans, the whole circuit would be closed. In mice, it's really hard to get high pressures in order to get the venous outflow back into the system, into the pump. So here, the venous outflow just goes into a dish, basically, and it's chemo waste. But a uh, very similar concept. You put the tourniquet on. We have someone in the lab who's very skilled at basically isolating tiny, tiny vessels and catheterizing them um, with our instrumentation here. So we've done the experiment a total of uh, three times. The third batch of mice, which has about uh, five mice per group, is still sort of percolating. But if you look at just tumor growth uh, in terms of just you know controls, there's not too much of a difference. Um, because of these standard deviations. That's if you batch them all together. So if you took all the averages and you batch them together, here's the control. These are people, these are mice which um, have no treatment. Phenylephrine alone is having some sort of effect. Um, we thought that this might be due to the hypoxia and the ischemia. If you can imagine, you know, the, the limb is already ischemic. Now you're adding something that vasocontracts that can have an effect on the tissues, the methylene group, and the combination. But if you look at each individual mouse, um, some of the average curves are skewed because of outliers. So, you know, the control we would all expect to not do well, the phenylephrine we would expect uh, to not do as well. The combinations, there are some mice, there are two mice that were particularly a problem. They just sort of took off. And that has to do with how the experiment's designed. So if you can imagine, you know, we have to inject the melanoma cells into the dermis of the mouse legs, but that's not going to be consistent each time. So before you do the treatment, certain mice are going to have bigger tumors than others. And we think that if we start at a tumor burden that's too high, the tumors will actually escape escape any of the treatment. So these are days post-treatment, not days from injection. We usually wait about a week before we actually try the treatment. So this spread is, is causing some issues in terms of basically the tumor size effects. But if you look at individual mice, I think for the most part, these mice here are, some of them are cured. Some of these mice are, we've been watching for three months now. The melanoma has regressed, but it's not, it's not uniform, even though all the mice are supposed to be clones. When we look at survival, again, the survival curve is incomplete because we have a third experiment that we're going to be adding. Um, this is a standard Kaplan-Meier. Overall, you know, there's differences between any of the treatments from control. There are still mice that need to be sacrificed and things like that, but the main, main thing we're looking at is, is the combination better than the drug alone? At this point, the p-value is not significant. It's 0 0.08, so basically, you know, this curve and this curve are still not significant, but we still have this experiment coming. We still have leftover mice from the second experiment that have to mature, so we're hoping that when all of that's done, this may actually become, uh, become significant. We looked at uh, creatinine kinase levels. This is something standard that you do after an ILI or an ILP. The regional therapy, you want to make sure they don't get compartment syndrome or too much muscle damage ischemia. Um, we didn't see any differences in terms across the different groups in terms of the level of creatinine kinase on post-op day two or three. Um, this may be due actually to the technique of harvesting the blood. It's done through uh, basically a facial vein prick or stabbing. So if there's too much uh, trauma to the vein, you can have hemolysis and things like that. So that will affect your CK levels. I'm um, happy to say that this technique has been approved as a provisional patent through Roswell Park, basically the part of using the mechanism of phenylephrine and saline bolus in humans in order to test what we've done in mouse to see if uh, we can individualize the responses to different drugs. And we're probably going to start with things like breast can inflammatory breast cancer because there's a lot of patients and it's something that doesn't require the operating room. It can be done in the clinic. So overall conclusions, um, IVM allows the direct observation of the restoration of flow to those vessels that were non-functional. 
This was the combination of the bolus and the phenylephrine, which was done in a reproducible manner. That seems to be better than just doing uh, bolus alone or phenylephrine alone. And going back to the mouse, as it, we translate all of the different tumor types we use, the colon, the breast, the melanoma, as we go to human patients, we have to be aware that different tumors may be doing different things in our model. And we're gonna, those are things that we're going to try to work out. Um, but in general, there's a potential for using this combination therapy to augment individualized tumor responses. Future directions, things that we're doing. So I talked a lot about the chemotherapy, but we do have a lot of immunotherapy. Um, and so what we're trying to do now is similar to that slide I showed you with the dots, like the white dots within the tumor vessels, looking at different ways to increase trafficking. So if we do this sort of dynamic control vessels, will that increase tumor, tra tumor effector cell trafficking to tumor sites? And if we give things like the checkpoint inhibitors, the CTLA-4, the PD-1, will that have an effect? Is that actually increasing delivery of these uh, trafficking cells to the tumor? So that will be done uh, as well. Um, it's interesting because I've kind of gone full circle. I, I, as Dr. Stewart mentioned, uh, received a PhD in immunology back at the New Jersey Cancer Institute, looking at CTLA-4. This was a time, this was like 10 years ago, um, at a time where CTLA-4 was not approved yet for humans <clears throat> or ipilimumab. Um, and it was something where immunologists thought that immunology was sort of like a, not a dying field, but sort of like uh, everyone was more focused on genomics and proteomics and things like that. But immunology has really blossoms, particularly in melanoma and expanding into other cell types. And so it's nice to kind of come full circle and do something similar now with this new technology. Uh, these are all the people in the lab that you know I give acknowledgments to, uh, different collaborators also at Roswell Park. And with that, I'll take questions. Uh, in the mouse models, no. So they're all primaries. In that human study I showed you with the 10 patients, uh, there were no metastases, but there, in terms of dysmetastases, but there was the in-transit disease, which is sort of a metastasis. It's like in between. And there was also some nodal disease. Has it been shown that the blood vessels or the angiogenesis is different between a primary and a mouse? Um, I'm not aware in terms of using the, the microscope to look at METs. Um, but, you know, in general, they're, they can be different. They certainly can be different. Different tumors can be different. You can have, for instance, in breast, you can have like a ERPR positive tumor in the primary that, for whatever reason, is negative in a metastasis. So you, you do see things like that. They're rare. Um, in terms of the tumor vasculature, I'm not sure. Um, it's hard to study the metastasis based on where it is. So if it's, you know, if a melanoma metastasizes the liver or the small bowel, that's going to be hard to put that window chamber in or study in real time in humans because of that motion artifact. So it's not something that I know the answer to at this point. The reason I brought it up is uh, Mary Pat Moyer, when she was here working, uh, she was able to grow both colon and gastric mucosa and also adenocarcinomas of both. And when we looked at it, we were stimulating them with gastrin. Hmm. And it stimulated growth in both the normal mucosa and also in the tumors. But the METs behaved differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why I was Did they that. also get simulated, or was it? But less. Oh, but less, OK. So maybe they differentiate, like de-differentiated and lost some of their pathways, basically. Yeah. So maybe just a purely hemodynamic question. Uh, Fine phenylephrine, uh, why not, for example, norepinephrine? It looks like if you were trying to really you know, push more blood volume in, you would add something that had a beta agonist effect as well as the alpha effect. Right. Uh, we just, we basically, the, the higher the heart rate becomes, the more sort of uh, artifact that you'll see in the mouse, their hearts will start. You could actually appreciate in some of them, like you can see sort of this motion artifact. Um, so that's why we stuck, stuck with something that would purely be vasoconstricted. It can be done. It certainly can be done with any vasoconstrictor. Um, but one of the reasons is, particularly in the human, if you gave it to a person, they're going to start, the heart rate's going to start being more rapid. We can sort of control 
breathing with the anesthesiologist and things like that to minimize it, but we're really trying to minimize the artifacts. So that was one of the reasons. Right. Um, I don't know. So that has to do, again, I think with what Dr. Cernick was talking about in terms of can you 